what's up everybody um, i'm so glad i'm so stoked that today i have the opportunity to speak the word of god to you today um, our subject matter for today it is the the atoning ministry of the lord jesus christ and um we'll be looking at the contrast between the ministry of the lord jesus christ and the ministry of aaron the high priest and then we'll just be comparing and contrasting those two those two just to see the supremacy and the excellency of the ministry of the work of the lord jesus christ um so when we speak about salvation uh we understand that we have been saved you know by grace we have been saved not by any works of righteousness that you and i have done but we are saved by grace alone it is the election by grace by favor you understand so we have been saved when you speak of salvation there are many words which are synonymous to salvation um in our biblical uh, vocabulary but there are so many words and all these words they are in a way speaking of salvation you know when you speak of salvation or speaking of justification because we're justified when we're saved you know then so that's what salvation is it is justification but not only is self uh, salvation justification salvation is also sanctification we were made sanctified you understand we were sanctified we were made holy it is sanctification not only that it is also propitiation because on the cross jesus made a propitiation for our sin you understand he he covered our sin he became a propitiation but not only that salvation is also redemption because we're redeemed from the curse of the law we're redeemed from sin we're redeemed from the bondage of sin not only that but salvation is also ransom because the lord jesus christ he paid the price he paid the price for us he paid the price for the bride so salvation is also ransom and not only that but it's also substitution because the lord jesus came and died in our place so salvation is also substitution not only is salvation substitution but salvation is also reconciliation because we're reconciled with the father and not only not, not only that but salvation is also atonement because um the lord jesus atoned for our sin he appeased the the punishment here he appeased the error of sin so we have to understand that uh, all these things they encompass salvation that the concept of salvation it is brought on its own and it's something i think we as a church need to go back to the basics we as a church need to start emphasizing all the more we as the church need to be so clarified concerning these things and um salvation is regeneration because we've been born again we've been born from above you understand we have been regenerated so all of these words you know they are all putting us back to salvation with the works of the cross and when you speak of atonement okay here is the the, the critical problem now, what we need to understand is that there is a sin problem there is a sin problem we are here today where we are because of sin so i'm not sin conscious uh, i'm grace conscious yes but we have to put everything in its perspective so we are here where we are today because of sin there was the or there was original sin there was sin when man first sinned you understand we are here today because of the sin of man and then god you know the most outstanding attribute of god i'll get back to the same issue the most outstanding attribute of god is his holiness you know more often in the bible when the when the bible speaks to us about the nature and the person of god the bible speaks to us of his holiness because the most outstanding and wonderful and awe-inspiring thing about god is his holiness the most wonderful thing about god the most awesome thing about god is his holiness yes i understand that god God is love I understand that God is life I understand that God is light I understand that God is all of those things you understand that they are all attributes of his nature but there, there is nothing which portrays who God is more than his holiness more than his holy there is nothing more than his holiness which sets him apart the angels in heaven they cry holy 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 is the lord because that's 
that is the most outstanding attribute about him and so we have to understand the holiness of god and now what happened in the garden it is that sin entered in the garden and when sin entered in the sin did not originate in the garden but sin entered in the garden and when sin entered in the garden men transgressed against god and after the transgression there was now enmity between god and man because the holiness of god was offended the holiness of god was offended by the transgression by the similitude of adam's transgression because of his disobedience and then the holiness of god was offended because of a lack of better words and then in god justice arose in god his wrath arose but now why is the wrath of god revealed because god does have wrath I'm not preaching an angry God, but if we speak a gospel and then we distance God from his wrath, that is not the gospel. If we distance God from his wrath, that is not the gospel. We have to speak about God in all of his attributes so that we can better appreciate the works of the cross. And so now, sin when it entered, right, it created a gap between God and man. Sin when it entered, it created offense between God and man. And because God is so holy, he cannot tolerate sin. He is unable to tolerate sin. In as much as God loves you and I, he still hates sin. His love for us will, no, will in no way change his hatred towards sin. And so now a problem God found himself in, and this problem is simply this, that the loving God, he hates sin, right? And the problem is that God loves man the most. Out of all creation, God loves man the most. But there is one thing God hates the most, and what God hates the most is sin. So this you have to understand. God hates sin the most on one hand, but God loves man the most on the other hand. And so now what happened in the garden is that what God hates the most found its way into what God loves the most. So you have to understand that God hates sin. You have to, he hates sin. And you cannot speak about one attribute of God at the expense of the nature of God. When we speak speak about God. We have to speak him in his wholeness because God is love. I agree. God loves us. But even the love of God is there for a reason. Even the love of God was revealed. And how was the love of God revealed? The love of God was revealed in dealing with the sin problem. The Bible says in the book of John, it says love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of transgressions. So sin, de love deals with the sin problem. If you speak about the love of God, which does not address the sin problem, that is not the love of God. There is something man made. There is a fantasy, but the love of God is well aware of the sin problem. And the love of God was revealed in order for it to deal with the sin problem. This you have to appreciate and this you have to understand. These are basic biblical truths. We have to understand. We have to lay hold on them so that we can understand why you and I needed to be saved. Why you and I need to find salvation. So in the garden when men sinned, there was now an offense against the holiness of God and then the wrath of God was invoked. And why was the wrath of God why was the wrath of God invoked? It was invoked by the justice of God because the justice of God demands that the, the, the violation against God's holiness, the violation against God's holiness must be punished. So now, this is where God found himself. But now, the love of God God then manifests itself because God loves us. Therefore, the love of God manifests itself to find a solution for the sin problem man finds himself in. And the love of God constrains God so 
knows that he is slow to anger because he loves he's slow to anger because his wrath should have consumed men in the garden but because because his wrath should have consumed us but because he loves us his love makes him slow to anger but that anger must be executed that wrath must be poured out so this is what we need to understand that we have God against whom man has sinned, man has disobeyed, and as a result, there is now a sin problem, and then the love of God is revealed in dealing with the sin problem. We see cases of it even in the garden. After mentioning God clothes him with animal skin, he propitiates, he covers him, a picture of what he will do with the sun to cover, to make make atonement for the sin of men. So now, God was enraged right, by sin because God hates sin. You know, there is something we need to understand about God. There is something about God we don't normally speak about anymore. And God is holy and God in His holiness can in no way tolerate sin. He can in no way, in no world, tolerate sin. And now we find ourselves with the sin problem. And then through similitudes, the Bible says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. The Bible says, the book of Psalms, in the book of Psalms 40, verse 8, it says, I delight to do thy will. So now in the old, it now speaks of the Son who is to come to fulfill his law, to fulfill his will. And then there is something particular I want to, to draw attention to today, and that is Aaron. And we see Aaron was a high priest. And Aaron is a light priest. In fact, Aaron means light bringer and light bearer, light bringer. And Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus brought light to the world. But now we see Aaron had to make atonement. Now, I am not talking about the great day of atonement, though I will touch on it because I'm speaking of atonement. But I'm speaking about the atoning ministry in its entirety as a concept. So Aaron, when he had to make atonement, he first had to make atonement for himself and his household. Right? He had to make atonement for himself and his household. And then he had to make atonement for the nation of Israel. And number three, he had to make atonement for the sanctuary because the sanctuary was polluted, it was defiled simply because sinful men was interacting with it. So the tabernacle itself, from the brazen altar, the brazen leather, the, the, the golden altar of incense, the, the table of shoe bread, the, the lampstand, all of it had to be, to be sanctified. They had to be atoned for. So this is what the high priest had to do. So in doing atonement, there are three aspects in atonement that Aaron did. Firstly, Aaron made atonement for himself and his entire household. And then Aaron made atonement for the entire nation. And then Aaron made atonement for the tabernacle itself and all of its vessels. So this atonement was necessary. And so we see he took a bullock and with the, with the sacrifice of the bullock, he makes atonement for himself and his entire household. And then there are two goats which are offered, the scapegoats, right? And then in this ceremony, in this sacrifice, they would cast lots. And then one lot would fall upon one goat. And this goat is called the goat for Jehovah. And then the lot fell on another goat. And then this goat is called the scapegoat. And the scapegoat is also called the goat of Azazel, right? We'll get into that in not so long. So there are two goats, one goat for Jehovah and one goat for Azazel called the scapegoat. And then in this we are seeing a picture that in the goat which goes to Jehovah, so there are two goats. Let me simplify it. There are two goats. And in these two goats, we are seeing a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in his two natures. One goat, it, rep it represents the divine nature of Christ. And the other goat represents the human nature of Jesus. And so we see two goats, one ministry. It's about atonement. So we find the goat for Jehovah. We also find the goat for Azazel. So the goat for Jehovah, it was given to the Lord and it was slaughtered for sin. It was given directly to God and then atonement was made. 
this is a picture of the divine nature of Christ that at the cross the son cried into your hands I commit my spirit that the divine nature of the son went back to the father okay the divine nature went back to the, to the father God in his divinity he says into your hands I commend my spirit in his divinity he returns to the father and then another goat was taken to the wilderness right so now we see that the human nature of Christ it was sent all the way to the grave right it was sent to death to the grave to the wilderness to the wild to, to take the keys of death and of Hades, of Sheol, you understand? So, to whereby you are going to triumph openly and victoriously over the enemy. So now there was one God which was sent into the world. It was sent into the wilderness, into a wild arena, triumphing publicly over the enemy. So there are two goals. These are the two natures of the sun. These are the two natures of the sun, okay? And then thirdly, Aaron made atonement for the entire sanctuary. He, so the blood was taken and it was applied upon the horns of the altar, dripped seven times. We know the story. And then Aaron made atonement for his entire household. He made atonement for himself. He made atonement for the nation. He made atonement for the sanctuary. And then comes Jesus whom the book of Hebrews contrasts him with Aaron. And this Jesus he is a better high priest. But the Bible tells us that he can be touched with the very feeling of our infirmities. That's Hebrews 4. He is touched with the very feeling of our infirmities. Do you know what that means? That he can be touched with the very feeling of our infirmity. It literally means how you and I feel in a moment of infirmity, in a moment of fear, of worry, of anxiety, of all those things. The very feeling of our infirmity, he is touched by it. What that literally means is that he, he is able to feel what you are feeling. Therefore, he is a merciful and faithful high priest. That is the, the ministry of the Son before the Father for us. He is touched with the very feeling of our infirmities. He doesn't just understand how we feel. You see, he doesn't just understand how we feel. He feels how we feel. He feels how we feel. He is touched with the very feeling of our infirmity. He feels how you and I feel. Now, I want us to read. I want us to read. So, remember, one goat for Jehovah, another goat for Azazel, called the scapegoat. One for Jehovah, one for Azazel. So, lots were cast, and to one goat, the lot was given, that it will be presented to the Lord. To another goat, the lot was given, that it was to be taken out into the wild. It was to be taken out into the wilderness. So we see that in, in the atoning ministry of Jesus, he came to deal with the wild side of sin, with the wild nature. My God, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. Leviticus 16 verse 5, it says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. This is just when Aaron had to make atonement for the nation. I'm just giving you a biblical reference for that. But all of these things, we have to find our New Testament interpretation because everything must be filtered through the cross because the cross of Jesus is the hermeneutical filter of the Bible. So everything must be filtered through the cross. Everything must be filtered through what Jesus did for us on the cross. Amen. So, the first thing when you contrast Jesus and Aaron, because Jesus is so much better, is that there was no atonement necessary. There was no atonement needed for Jesus. Because Jesus was, was perfect in, in, 
in morality. He was perfect in action indeed. There was no sin in him. He was perfect. If sin was found in him, he would not qualify to be a redeemer. He would not qualify to be the sacrifice because the lamb must be without spot and without blemish. So in him we find no blemish at all. In him we find no sin at all. The Bible says these three things are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So now this is spoken to us by John. And John also says, they're quoting the Lord Jesus. He says, the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. So when the enemy comes, he can find nothing in him because there, there is no accusation he can make against him because the son is completely without sin. Even when he was tempted, he was without sin. Even when he was on the cross, on that fairy tale, he was without sin because the son is without sin. So it's without sin. So Christ needed no atonement. He did not need anyone to make atonement for him. He was sinless. He was sinless. Because Aaron was a sinful and imperfect high priest. He first needed to make atonement. Before he did anything, he must first make atonement for himself. He must be clean first because before you start talking about the sins of others, he himself must be clean first. So Aaron must make atonement for himself and then make atonement for the, for the rest of the priests and the Levites, his household, and then make atonement for the nation and then make atonement for the sanctuary. So we're going to see how Jesus did it and we're going we're gonna to contrast all those three points with the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's open Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So, you see, every high priest is taken from among men for things pertaining to men, that he may offer sacrifices unto God. But this high priest was not chosen among men. Oh my goodness. Verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. This is speaking of the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical order. Verse 3, and by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but see, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So you have to contrast it with the second verse. These are important verses that I believe we as believers should know them off by heart. Hebrews 7, right? Verse 22 to verse 28. Hebrews 7, 22 to 28. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. So Jesus is better than Aaron because he is a surety of a better testament. Aaron ministered an old testament, an inferior testament. He, he ministered it, right? And as he ministered it, he was not even a surety of it, though he ministered it, though he administered it. Okay, so now Jesus, he, he administers a better testament. And not only that, he is the surety of that administration. Verse 23, And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So, Christ is better, because his priesthood is an unending priesthood. Because all these priests in the order of Aaron, you name them Eliezer, Abiathar, um, Zadok, you name all the high priests, uh, Eliashib, you name all of them. They all died and their ministry ended. In fact, a person served as priest. He, he served as priest from the age 30 until the age 50. So he served as high priest only for 20 years. And then at 50, you must retire. The year of Jubilee, the year of Pentecost, you must retire. So a person is only high priest for 20 years, only 20 years, and then they die 
right? But now here is one thing we see about Jesus. That his priesthood is an unending priesthood. He continues in his priesthood because he is without death. He is so much superior. Verse 24. But this man, because he continueth forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Oh my goodness. My goodness. Verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Brethren, this is what you need to understand. The Son is able to save us to the uttermost who come to God by him. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. I want you to understand, dear listener, I want you to understand this, my brother, my sister, that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. And because he's ever living to make intercession for us, he is able to save us to the utmost. To the uttermost. He's able to save us if you come to God by him. So it's only by him. It's only through him. He's able to save us to the uttermost. If only you are willing to come unto God by him. He can save us to the uttermost. He can save us to the uttermost. No matter how deep you are in those muddy waters. No matter how deep he is able to save us to the uttermost. This is exemplified on the cross. Two thieves. Two thieves. One unrepented. One repenting. And as they are dying, one thief, he addresses the other thief. He says, this man is innocent. This man did nothing worthy of death. You and I, we are here because of our sins. This man did nothing worthy of death. And after saying that, he speaks to Jesus. And he says, Lord, remember me in paradise. And then Jesus responds, says, today, you shall be with me in paradise. In fact, the man says, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus says, today, you shall be with me in paradise. If I was to touch a little bit on that, on the cross with the two thieves, in that we are seeing a picture of Jesus at the tree again. Jesus hanging on the tree. So we see Jesus hanging on the tree to rectify what went wrong at another tree. <laughs> so there is something which went wrong at another tree. And Jesus is rectifying on this tree what happened on another tree. Remember Deuteronomy and Galatians, cursed is he who hangs upon a tree. So Jesus is hanging upon a tree. Now I believe with all of my heart, I believe with all of my heart that the tree Jesus was hanging on is the very same tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus went back to the garden as a carpenter. He chopped down that tree, fashioned for himself a cross, and he hung on that cross. I believe so much in my heart. I believe so much in my heart. And then Jesus hanging on the tree, we see a picture of Adam, and a picture of Satan, right? So how do, how do I say that and how do I justify that, right? This is not literally Satan, this is not literally Adam, right? But in them, we are finding a satanic voice and an Adamic voice. Because in this one, it says, he says, if you are the son of God, save yourself and us, if you are the son of God. This one symbolizes Satan. In fact, I believe Satan was possessing this one. And why do I say that? Because Satan, in his temptation in the wilderness, when he tempted him, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, every time he tempted him, if you are the son of God, because Jesus is the son of God, right? So that's why he was tempting him, because he's from the Father. He's tempting him with his nature. He's tempting him with who he is. 
You see, that's how the enemy tempts. That's how the enemy works. The enemy will always tempt you in the area of your greatest strength. Satan will always tempt you where you are strongest. Listen, look at Adam and Eve. God made them in his image, in his likeness. And how does Satan come to tempt them? Satan comes to tempt them. And listen to what Satan says when Satan is tempting them. He says, if you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. You will be like God. They are already made in the image of God. So, when Satan comes, he comes in the area of your strength. That's why he comes and he wants you to believe it's a weakness. He comes in the area of your strength and he wants you to believe it's a weakness. That's why also, Satan comes to the sun. Because Jesus is the sun. Right? He is the sun. And he tempts him. Tests him. Provoking him. He says, if you are the son of God. So in those words, we can see Satan. We can trace him because of how he speaks. But here's another thing. Here is another thing. After the Lord Jesus dealt with Satan, because he says, the last thing Jesus said, he says, you will not tempt the Lord your God. Right? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Because Jesus was reminding Satan, hey Baba, this is God you are talking to. You will not tempt the Lord your God. And then Satan that moment left. Right? And Satan left. But the Bible tells us he departed for a season. That means he came back. He departed for a season. That was season is Kairos. You see, child of God, when you enter into the Kairos of God, when you enter into your opportune moment, there is no devil. When you enter into an opportune moment, Satan is out of the picture. That is God's moment for you. You better seize it. You better seize it. And then Satan appears again. And he says, if you are the son of God, save yourself and us. So we see Satan is here again. Save yourself and us. The Bible says, had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then, here is this other guy. And this guy starts talking to this other one. He says, we are here because of what we have done. So I connect that with Adam eating from the tree and, and Satan tempting Eve. Remember in the garden, Adam played the blame game. He says, the woman whom he gave me made me do this. But now he's taking responsibility. He says, we are here for what we have done. This man has done nothing wrong. Right? This man has done nothing wrong. And then he says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. The word remember, it means to put together again. To remember. Right? To put all your members again. Remember me. This is Adam's cry, the patriarch of all humanity. Remember mankind again. Put us back together to what we were meant to be. And then he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Only one person has ever been, has ever been in paradise, has ever been in Eden, right? In delight. Only one man has ever been there. And then he says, remember me in your kingdom. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. So I see those two. I see those two. And so, the Lord Jesus, he is a much better sacrifice because he is touched with the very feeling of our infirmities. He is touched with the very feeling of our, infir of our infirmities. So, he is able to save them. Right? Verse 25, Hebrews 7. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him. Oh no, I'm seeing my timer here. I've got less than eight minutes left. He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Right? So, even that man on the cross, he was about to die. He has been a sinner. He's dying for his sins. And at that moment, Jesus saved him. At that moment, and Jesus gave him an assurance that today, you will be with me in paradise. Imagine. Imagine. 
after this man has been a sinner and all that, all he had to do was just confess Jesus. At that moment, and Jesus gives him an assurance that today you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. So, this is what you need to understand. Even if you are confused with your sexuality, even if you are struggling with drugs, even if you are struggling with immorality, addictions, Jesus, the Jesus I'm preaching, He is able to save you to the uttermost. He's able to save you to the uttermost if you come to God by Him. If you come to God by Him. Because He's the only way. By Jesus, He can save you to the uttermost. He can save you to the uttermost. Oh, goodness. Verse 26, Hebrews 7. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not dangly, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. So thus the antitype greatly surpasses the type. In this Aaron is the type, and Jesus is the antitype. So I have not even touched on um, okay, I'll touch on one aspect how Aaron had to make atonement for himself and how Jesus is far better in that he did not have to make atonement for himself um, the other aspects we do not get time to touch on right? Uh, since this is an online service I understand that your data is precious uh, thank you so much uh, I am praying for you I am praying for you I am believing God for you if you are watching this and, and you are not saved, if you are watching this and are saying, I do not know Jesus as Lord and as Savior, I, I am praying for you. I am praying for you. I am praying that you understand Romans 10, uh, verse 9 and 10. For, if, for with the mouth, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. They shall believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and shall confess the mouth that God is raising from the dead. You shall be saved. You shall be saved. Hey, you shall be saved. You shall believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You shall be saved. He is able to save you to the uttermost if you come to God by Him. By Him. He is able to save you to the uttermost. He is able to save you to the uttermost. Whether you are watching this on a hospital bed, whether you are watching this from a prison cell, whether you are watching this from the shackles of sin, whether you are watching this while you are eating with the pigs in the mud, it does not matter. He is able to save us to the uttermost. To the uttermost. At all lengths. There is no one who won't kick down. He is able to save us to the uttermost. Glory to Jesus. Praise be to Jesus. I am praying for you. I am praying that you find salvation. I am praying that you find Jesus. I am praying that you find meaning in Him. I am praying that you find revival. I am praying that you find redemption. I pray that you find healing in your body. I pray that you are ministered unto. I pray that the blessings of God upon you. I pray the blessings of heaven upon you. May God's face shine upon you. May His countenance shine upon you. May you walk in newness of life. May you be a different creature altogether. I pray so much for you. I pray the blessing of Naphtali. Oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full of the blessing of the Lord. Like Moses prayed for the tribe of Naphtali, I pray for you listening to this message. Oh, Naphtali, oh, child of God, satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord. We decree this word and we declare it over your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Be blessed. Shalom.